My name is Patricia Casey and I'm a consultant psychiatrist in the Hermitage Medical Clinic in Dublin. I'm Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry in University College Dublin and I'm interviewing Professor Anne Doherty who is a Professor of Psychiatry in University College Dublin and a consultant psychiatrist in Liaison Psychiatry in the Mater Misericordia University Hospital in Dublin. And thank you for doing this interview. Thank you very much. Can I ask, in your present job, do you see patients to whom our discussion might apply? Do you see patients with life-threatening illnesses? Absolutely. So in, in my role as a liaison psychiatrist, we work at the interface of me medical and um, psychological problems. So I have two parts to my role. One is I look after people who present to the hospital who are suicidal or who maybe have um, attempted an act of self-harm of some description. The other part of my role is that I work with the psycho-oncology service, so we look after people with cancer diagnoses, some of whom may have terminal diagnoses, and we try to treat any mental illnesses that they might have, um, and in particular we, we see a lot of depressive illnesses and people maybe who have suicidal thoughts. So. My, my work is very relevant to, to the material that we'll be discussing today. Um, you have published a scientific paper recently in BJ Psych Open, that is the British Journal of Psychiatry Open Access Journal, and it's a very prestigious journal. Um, it's dealing with suicide and assisted suicide. Um, could you summarise the study? Tell us, tell us a little bit about it. So this study was conducted last year by myself and a number of other um, collaborators and what we decided to do was to do a systematic review of the literature around assisted suicide and its relationship to suicide. So we looked at any, we looked throughout all of the published literature in the area to find the highest quality papers and we compared, we, we then examined those papers in much more detail to provide, um, I suppose, a definitive synthesis of the literature in this area. So this, this basically involves us screening all of the papers that have been written in the area of overlap between assisted suicide and suicide and we selected those that looked at both rates together in a population. So we we, we arrived at six papers actually that were the highest quality papers that, that looked at this and that examined this in a lot of detail. And these were from a number of, number of different jurisdictions where there is some form of euthanasia, assisted suicide or um, medically, me medical assistance in dying um, which has been legislated for. Now for the purposes of this we're going to call it euthanasia and assisted suicide so we're not jumbling up the terminology because again they're, they're used interchangeably even though aspects may have different 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 meanings. Um, the, the studies that came up were from, there were two from Switzerland, two from the various states in, in, in the US that have legislated for, for this, and one from the Netherlands and one from Belgium. And these all examined the relationship between suicide and assisted suicide. We had decided to do this because, as you probably know, in Ireland there was a private members bill that went through the, the, our, our parliament uh, last year, which looked at this issue. But as well as that, there have been, there's been some public discourse around the relationship between EAS and suicide, with some commentators suggesting that if EAS was available, it might e remove... EAS is euthanasia, euthanasia and, and assisted, assisted suicide. suicide. Yes. That if this was available, it might reduce the suicide rates in people with terminal illnesses. Now, from my own clinical experience and from some of the literature around this, this seemed highly unlikely and it seemed like a spurious claim. One of the other systematic reviews that had been done the year before, which examined people who um, had euthanasia or assisted suicide for psychiatric indications. So these weren't people with terminal illnesses, these were people with psychiatric illnesses. This found that the profile of people who died by euthanasia or assisted suicide was almost identical to the profile of those who died by suicide. Um, so as a result we, we really thought it was unlikely that this was going to reduce suicide rates. If anything it's making suicide more more accessible and that's why we decided to examine this in, in, in more detail. Yes. Can I ask you to describe what a systematic review is? So a systematic review is a very, I suppose, it's a very formal process of examining the literature in a particular area. In terms of being, um, being 
I suppose we, we have different levels of evidence when we talk about the scientific evidence in, in medicine. We have case reports at the very bottom, then we have observational studies, case control studies, randomised control trials. Now obviously one can never do a randomised control trial of something like euthanasia, um, so that's out of the question here. And then the next level is systematic reviews, which is the highest level of synthesis that we can really do. And that brings together the various other types of research we have in the area and allows us to combine it all and look at it on the round so that we're looking at all of the evidence that's available. What it involves is you have a number of researchers who sit down, we refine the, the question that we're going to ask, we then are required to register our question in advance so we're not going to be messing with the data. So that's registered in an international database called Prospero which allows this to be, it, it just, it just add, adds an extra level of robustness. Uh, and then we go and we look at the literature, um, we do a massive search and usually about, I, th I think we found about 11,000 papers that met the criteria here we had to sift through all of those um, some of them were obviously nothing to do with it some were, were quite relevant and we eventually whittled it down to six papers and only six papers which examined the relationship in population suicide rates between um, assisted suicide and euthanasia and suicide more generally. Has anybody else done a systematic review on the, the subject you're looking at which is the, the question you're, that you're asking is, um, is assisted suicide euthanasia associated with a reduction in the suicide rate as has been suggested? Has that been examined by anybody else in a systematic no, review? not in a systematic review. There have been a number of papers that have, have examined this and actually there have been one or two papers that have actually been published since our paper um, but weren't included because of the, the time frame. Um, but Obviously, we've, we've only just um, only just published it, so that there is an interest in the area. But ours is the first systematic review that looks at the the evidence on the round. And what were your findings? So what we so we we were looking at it to to see what the relationship would be, and what we found is that in areas where euthanasia or assisted suicide was legislated for, the rates of the overall rates of self-initiated death went up. Now that's to be expected because you are making a form of self-initiated death readily available. Um, so if you include so we, we talked about self-initiated death as including traditional suicides, if, if that's the right term to use, and assisted suicides or euthanasia. So we included those all together in self-initiated death. And we, we expected that those numbers should go down if the theory that had been outlined before, that having a, this service available would reduce suicide rates. Now, we did not find that. We found that, if anything, the rates went up. The rates went up in all of the studies. Um, when we controlled for other factors, so when we considered in, in the Dutch study they examined divorce rates and levels of socioeconomic deprivation and religiosity actually and when they controlled for those they found that there was no overall change but again you know th those are those are factors that will influence suicide as well as a su assisted suicide because those you know those are all risk factors for for, for suicide as we know um, so there, 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 there were some some aspects that were controlled out what I found particularly interesting about this was that although all of the rates went up, the rates were particularly high in certain groups. They were particularly high in older adults um, and, and they seem to have been disproportionately affected by this legislation. And in particular there seems to be a gender aspect as well. Women were disproportionately affected. So in the Swiss study for example they found that over the the 10-year period that they examined towards what they found was that older men's rates of death went up twofold, older women's went up threefold. And this is concerning because we know that women are at higher risk of developing depression. The rates of depression are higher in women. And it does raise the question of whether or not we are, what we're actually seeing here are higher rates of untreated depression that are being given assisted suicide rather than evidence-based treatment for depression. Now our study can't comment on that, but it does raise that question. And I do wonder if that's the phenomenon that's underlying this. Is that something you would intend to look at in the future in a study? 
definitely. I think it's something that we need to look at and it's something that we need to have answers to because I think the concern that we all have as psychiatrists is that instead of actively preventing suicide and treating depression and treating mental illness, that actually we're just saying, fine, you know, there's no need to do that because you have a terminal illness and I don't think any of us think that that's ethical really. Um, have any, I mean, your study was published back in, was it April of this year? April I think, of this yes. Year, yeah. Have, have any other studies similar to this been published since then that, that you're aware of? There are two other studies that have come out since then. Actually, it's a, a fruitful year for, for, for this area of research. And they've again found the same thing, that the suicide rates do not in fact go down and that there are certain vulnerable groups that are at greater risk as a result of this. So I think if we were to redo this systematic review in a few years time, we would probably have even more evidence because again, more time will have passed since this has been legislated yes. for. Obviously, the, the the role that depression plays, depressive illness plays in all of this is of concern to psychiatrists, particularly as is suicide prevention. Now, the um, College of Psychiatrists of Ireland have brought out a very strong um, position paper on this, I think the Ethics and Human Rights uh, Group. Um, can you tell us what what aspect, well, first of all, what, what the college documents said and what aspects did they focus on in their paper? Did they focus on the depression side or on the, um, the, the, on, on the suicide side or, or what, what aspects? Yes, so we, our colleagues in the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland published a, a position paper last year which examined this issue and I think it was quite timely because with the public or the private members bill that went through our parliament last year it really created I think a lot of concern about this debate and the importance of having a clear position available. This isn't unusual or other other or the other Royal Colleges in Ireland have produced similar papers so the Royal College of Physicians in particular has a very strong position paper about what they feel their role is and what their view on this is. And what was their view? They, well, they, they felt that euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide were completely unacceptable and shouldn't be and, and shouldn't be countenanced and they talked about the importance of good palliative medicine and good pain relief and all of these things that, that we would all probably view as being very important as being the priorities. The, the psychiatry position paper was very interesting because it looked at this mainly through the lens of suicide prevention and the fact that we spend all of our professional lives trying to prevent suicide and trying to, to treat the sorts of illness that put people at greater risk of suicide, things like depressive illnesses and, and any other major mental illness that has an impact on, on people's suicidality. And in Ireland we have this marvellous system which is called the National Clinical Programme for, for Self-Harm, which is probably one of the first national programs anywhere in the world that actively puts resources in to manage the outcomes for people who who are suicidal or who might have 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 presented with an act of self-harm to our emergency departments and of course as a result of that we are seeing a reduction in suicide in Ireland thankfully in the last few years which is a really welcome finding and it's really nice to see these rates going going down because it it's it's you know it's it's kind of fundamental to the human condition that we yes preserve life. Um, so that was one of the priorities for the College of Psychiatry. The other, the other concerns were concerns around capacity, the mental capacity to make a decision, and concerns around areas like coercion and elder abuse, where maybe older people who might already be vulnerable, who might already perhaps be lonely, might be Felt, it, might, it might be felt that there is almost a, a duty to die in, in some of these situations and that was a big concern for us. We know that we're not good at detecting coercion, we know that the vast majority of cases of elder abuse are not often picked up by doctors, so in terms of assessing that there were grave concerns about, about how, that, how that might proceed and the, the position paper finished off I suppose by highlighting the fact that we need to redouble our kind of suicide prevention efforts and that we need to make sure that people who are facing terminal illnesses or difficult medical conditions have the appropriate medical and psychiatric treatment available. And again, coming back to services like the National um, Clinical Programme for Psycho-Oncology, it's really good that we have 
dedicated resources to look after the mental health of people with cancer diagnoses. But there are gaps in other areas and we know that you know there, there is a need to build up our pain services and our pain psychological services um, and mental health services linked with neurology as well in, in terms of conditions like you know, motor neuron disease, etc. There's a real need to have more integrated mental health care there. And all of this is set out in the position paper as, as being the priorities and probably the more evidence-based ways of moving things forward mm -hmm. rather than, I suppose, accepting that we should be, you know, considering that, that suicide is a reasonable thing for somebody with a terminal illness yeah. to choose. I gather from what you've said about the new studies that have been published since since yours and since the Irish College's position paper, that those studies would support the position of the Irish College as well, from what you have said. Am I right in that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Again, they, they would all show that, that, that the rates go up, that certainly people aren't necessarily as protected as we would like them to be. And... I suppose the news that we're getting from Canada as well in terms of the progression of the MAID legislation, which is the Medical Assistance in Dying, has gone from being something that had some had quite tight safeguards to a very obvious loosening of safeguards in the last year. And next year, people who do not have a terminal illness, who merely have mental illness, whether or not it's, it's treated or untreated is unclear, but they will be able to apply and be eligible for um, basically euthanasia or assisted suicide and that is a big concern for us because I think once once we legislate for something like euthanasia it's very difficult to say then that people with mental illnesses are, are not being discriminated against if they're if they're excluded from it and it seems to it seems to progress in that way by by by, by virtue of ongoing court appeals so yeah, so our position, I think, is, 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 is very clearly supported by the evidence, by the literature and by the, the evolution of the literature, which is, as, yes. as you mentioned, is coming out quite clearly. Have you any thoughts that might assist some of those who are watching this, this discussion between us, Anne? I suppose it's probably a very difficult topic for somebody who is living with a terminal or a chronic illness or maybe somebody who has uncontrolled symptoms of pain or nausea or any any of the symptoms that can go with these these chronic conditions and I suppose you know our, what we would recommend is that people you know advocate we, we all advocate that services get better but people are entitled to good services and we would certainly you know advocate that people seek them out and that they get the help that they need if, if they're if, if they're struggling um, and certainly there's you know th there's a lot of supports out there from both the, the state and the voluntary sector that are available to help people and we can we can put up um, helplines at, at the end of this if needed okay thank you very much indeed Anne thank you very much